Karen from the beach is possibly going to come and share her testimony with us about being on the tour. But uh, she wasn't able to come this week. So you're st stuck with me. Uh, the, top, the topic today is subjugating Satan once and And uh, I believe as you know, the pastor, my main responsibility is to share the divine principle, to share the teaching of our, of, of our movement with us and to help us to understand it and how it relates to us. And uh, I hope and pray that everybody here, you know, we come to church on Sunday and it's the tradition all through history, the, the tradition of religion is people go to church and they worship on Sundays. But the reality is, is that every moment of our lives, we are meant to have a relationship with God. Life is going on all the time. Even when you sleep, you know, you sometimes have dreams, and those dreams might be significant to you. Before you go to bed at night or when you wake up, the things that you do when you go to work, when you go to school, when you're taking care of your, your, your family, when you're you know, on your own by yourself, when you're watching television, anything we're doing, God is always with us. God is always with us. And one of the things about true parents, those of us that were around him, he was always talking about God, always sharing about God's will and God's providence, God's hope, uh, God's purpose of creation, about the fall of man, what prevents us from having a relationship with God. Father's entire life, his purpose was to educate us, to teach us the truth about God. So yes, it is the tradition to come to church on Sundays, and yes, I'm the pastor and I'm giving the message, but the reality is, is that every single one of us here is God's son and daughter. And we're meant to, to have a living relationship with God every moment of our lives. And the principle teaches us this. This is from the last part of the principle of creation. And I believe that if we study this part of the principle correctly, it will help us understand exactly who true parents are and why they came. First it says, the human mind consists of the spirit mind and physical mind. The relationship between these two minds is like that between internal nature and external form. When they become one through give and take action with God as their center, they form a unit, united functioning entity which guides the spirit self and physical self to become harmonious and pro progress toward the purpose of creation. This united entity is the mind of a human being. Mind and body unity. How many times have we talked about we're supposed to have mind and body unity centered on God? Well, we live in a material world, and we are spiritual beings at the same time. So through science, through logic, through a certain way of understanding and studying about reality, we see things, we hear things, we smell things, we taste things, we touch things, we go to school, we gather information, we have knowledge. That knowledge is external material knowledge. But there's another kind of knowledge, the internal spiritual knowledge. And to be a, a, a complete human being, the two have to be harmonized, centered on reality, centered on God, centered on the original principles of the creation, the universal principles that are both physical and spiritual. The conscience is that faculty of the human mind which by virtue of its inborn nature always directs us toward what we think is good. However, due to the fall, Human beings have become ignorant of God and thus ignorant of the absolute standard of goodness. For this reason, we are unable to set the proper standard of judgment for our conscience. As the standard of goodness varies, the standard of our conscience also fluctuates. 
This causes frequent contention, even among those who advocate a conscientious life. Our conscience, God designed and created us to have an internal kind of, like a compass that's pointing in the direction of goodness. But that conscience is connected to what we believe is true. What do we believe is reality? What do we believe is good or evil? Because we guide our conscience. We live a conscientious life based on what we believe is good and evil. That's why religious teaching through history has been so important. Because the purpose of the prophets that came, Moses, Abraham, Jesus, the prophet Muhammad, Buddha, Confucius, these men, these people were teaching a truth about the internal reality, about God's standard, about an absolute standard. But they didn't know the absolute standard. And they didn't teach the absolute standard. Christianity doesn't understand fully or completely the truth about God or Satan or even Jesus whom Christians follow so adamantly. Muslims don't believe and understand the clear truth about God or Satan or good or evil. Atheists, scientists, Buddhists, it doesn't matter. But people do try to live a conscientious life. And as we'll study, Christianity has come a long way in educating us to the fundamentals, to the basic, because of the example of Jesus. But the conscience is important, but the conscience we can't, if we only live according to our conscience, we can make mistakes. We're fallible. Because we don't have all the information. We don't know the truth clearly. The original mind is the faculty of the human mind which pursues absolute goodness. It relates to the conscience as internal nature and external form. So our conscience is influenced by material, by knowledge, by reason, by law, by, by logic. But the original mind is something more internal. It's a spiritual entity. It isn't directly connected to what we think is the truth. So God designed and created us not just to live according to our conscience, but he embedded in us an original nature. It is directly from God. A person's conscience directs him to pursue goodness according to the standard which he has set up in ignorance even though it may differ from the original standard. However, the original mind, being sensitive to the proper direction, repels this faulty standard and works to correct the conscience. So we, it's like a magnet. It's like inside every human being. Very subtle, extremely subconsciously, there is an original nature. Because where do we come from? Where does the energy that actually causes us to exist come from originally? It comes directly from God. We have always been directly connected to God on one level or another. But that original nature, because of the fall, was covered over and isn't able to connect to reality. As long as our spirit mind and physical mind are under the bondage of Satan, the functioning entity they form through their give and take action is called the evil mind. The evil mind continually drives people to do evil. Our original mind and conscience directs us to repel the evil mind. They guide us in desperate effort to reject evil desires and cling to goodness by breaking our ties with Satan and turning to face God. So, if we don't know the truth, 
even though our conscience is trying to, to teach us the right thing, we can't, we can't break free. Because of the fall of man, when the fall took place, we lost God's words. We lost our understanding of reality. Human beings became totally materialistic, except we're not materialistic. Inside, because of the fall, Satan's nature, selfishness, anger, resentment, hatred, greed, lust, these kinds of characteristics, you know, jealousy, uh, you know, wanting to, you know, this extreme selfishness, this extreme selfish nature covered, covered our, our mind. And so people fell. This man is probably very conscientious. You know, there are Muslims, there are Christians, there are Buddhists, there are atheists who are very conscientious people. But because they have, on some level or another, connected to a false idea, a false doctrine, a false teaching, a lie, then even they can push themselves to do heinous acts. The standard, the original standard of goodness lies in understanding the original purpose of creation. So, you know, nowadays we're inundated. You know that word inundated? If, if you watch the news, you know, I'm, I'm a, I could be a news junkie if I wanted to be, and I, I want to know, I want to, you know, gather information. We're meant to gather information and learn things. That's why we go to school. If you have anything that you're interested in, you know, if you watch football, <laughs> you're going to learn about football. How does it, what are the rules, you know, how do people play, who's, who's good, who's not. If you have a hobby, if, you know, everything, we, we gather information. Originally, you know, the media, our, the news, television, radio, is supposed to give us information so that we can, you know, better our lives. How many people watch Dr. Oz? Okay, my, my wife's not in the room or she raised her hand. Why, why do people watch Dr. Oz? Okay, because he's going to be sharing information about health, about something to do with what you can do to improve your life. So, you know, my wife, sometimes she tries to get back at 4 o'clock, between 4 and 5 o'clock. She wants to see Dr. Oz because Dr. Oz is going to talk about a particular topic. Okay, that's an example of the media helping. But the bottom line is our standard, our standard of truth, what we understand to be the truth, even Christian people, okay, sincere, loving Christian people, what is their standard of conscience? It's limited. It's limited. Because they have certain doctrines that are so deeply embedded in the, the history of Christianity. A certain concept about how God is going to judge this world. About how Jesus is going to return in a supernatural way. About what it means to be forgiven of sin. About the reality or did not reality of the spiritual world. About hell. That some people are going to go to hell forever. If a person's mindset, if their, their thinking is that this is the truth, then they are guided to live their, a conscientious life, but they can never rise above that. I want to talk about and read from, this is the speech, and this is very interesting because this is a very public speech. This is the speech that Father gave in February of 2000 at the opening banquet of the World Culture and Sports Festival. And I found this speech in a book about the media conferences. And this was the speech that Father also gave. This, he gave it here, but he was also speaking to the representatives of the media. You know, Father created the Washington Times, uh, the Noticias del Mundo, you know. Why? Why was Father so interested in the media? Very clearly because he understands the purpose of the true parents 
is to educate mankind about the truth of God. So here's Father speaking. He says, the new millennium that just began is a time to clean away the divisions and conflicts of the past century and to manifest the ideal of a one world family of harmony and unification. I would like to begin by thanking you for congratulating me on my 80th birthday. Most of all, I would like to return to God all the honor and glory given to me because it is he who has watched over me until this day. As a boy of 16, I came into contact with the will of heaven through prayer. And throughout my life after that, I have devoted all my spirit and energy to accomplishing God's will. I came to understand that the fundamental cause of human unhappiness is that the relationship with God was severed by the fall. As a result of the fall, human beings fell into a state of spiritual ignorance. In an effort to resolve the fundamental problems this has caused among humans and the, in the universe, I have spoken publicly on more than 10,000 occasions in many places around the world and set forth a true view of humanity, a true view of the world, and the true view of history based on Godism. Very bold claim. I'm traveling all around. I'm teaching the truth about God, about history, about, you know, the situation. Well, Father did. The divine principle is the truth. These speeches have been translated into 12 languages and published in 300 volumes. The contents of these speeches are not the result of a comprehensive study of historical documents. My conclusions are not the result of scholarly research. Instead, I arrived at these answers to basic and fundamental questions through my communications with both the visible and invisible worlds. By father's life experience, from the age of, you know, when he was, after he was born, growing up in, within his family, in Korea, all the things he experienced, and then his spiritual experiences, his communion with God, with Jesus, with the saints and sages, then all of this father researched and studied and learned and prayed and eventually discovered, discovered the truth that is what we call the divine principle. The issue of unifying the Korean Peninsula is the solemn desire of our people and the final act of bringing the global Cold War to a conclusion. So today, as I express my gratitude for your having prepared this meaningful forum, I would like to share with you on the topic, North-South Unification and World Unification will be accomplished by true love. And lay out the basic answer for how to bring about unification. The unification of our country involves more than the mere unification of national territory. It begins with the unification of the human mind and body that were divided against one another as a result of the fall. And it, has, and it is the model for the unification of the world that has been divided in two. Thus, this issue must be understood from the perspective of God's salvation providence. It must be resolved on a providential level. Father's very clearly saying mind and body unity. This has to do with God. This has to do with the providence. Korea, the world, every problem that we have comes to precisely this point. And what is this point? What is Satan's ultimate target behind the history of struggle between good and evil ever since this conflict was brought into being as a result of the fall of the first human ancestors? Satan has his sights set precisely on God himself. God is eternal, unchanging, absolute, and unique. And the standard of the ideal that he held at the beginning of creation must also have these qualities. If you were to ask God directly, I think he will confirm what I am saying. How can God reply when Satan says to God, God, 
When you made me an archangel in the beginning, were you acting out of a love for me that was temporary or eternal? I think God will say that he made him the archangel out of a love that was eternal. If he were to say that his love was temporary, that would make him an ephemeral God. Unless he maintains a standard of loving Satan eternally, there will eventually come a time when he will no longer be able to exercise his authority as God with respect to Satan. Thus, no matter how much Satan may oppose him, God has no choice other than to establish the condition of loving Satan. Father's explaining God's love is absolute, unchanging, eternal. When God designed and created the universe, he created it to follow a certain pattern, a certain principle. And the archangel that God created, Lucifer, was a part of the process and was meant to have some relationship with Adam and Eve in the garden. And they were meant to fulfill a certain providential purpose to accomplish God's ideal. So God, from the moment he created the archangel, in, intended that he is going to have an eternal relationship, just as he intended to have an eternal relationship with us. So God has to react and respond to the fallen situation with the heart of eternal love. In other words, there is no, when we really understand the fall of man, that the archangel is actually created by God, and that Satan is not some mystical being that just showed up one day in the universe. You know, Christianity, if you try to ask the question about Satan, it's very unclear. Where does this being come from? How can there be a Satan? If God is the only creator, if there's only one God, he must have created Satan. He must have created evil. It's the only logical explanation if you insist that God is God. Only the divine principle explains the identity of the archangel. That truth in and of itself is what allows us to guide our lives beyond the limits of the, complete, the growing period, the growing stage, and gives us the opportunity to come into a direct connection with the living God. Because Satan is blocking us, preventing us, not only from connecting to God inside, but up here. The conscience of Christians, they can't connect to God. Muslims, Buddhists, it doesn't matter. They can't really, profoundly, intimately connect to the living God because there's this wall, this barrier, Satan. Satan says to God, I became an evil scoundrel as a result of the fall, but you and good people can't use methods that are similar to mine, can you? I may like to fight, but you're not supposed to enjoy fighting. Even when you take a blow, you have to endure, don't you? Thus God's philosophy is one of non-resistance. Why is that? It is because until the world of the heavenly ideal is manifested on this earth, God must love the archangel who has become Satan, regardless of the circumstances. No one ever knew this. No one ever knew the secret identity of Satan. Why does God put up with evil? Why does God put up with so much tragedy through history, the entire history of fallen men? Why do good people suffer? Because God knows profoundly and deeply. First of all, we have eternal life. So whatever suffering we're going through here, God knows that someday, someday, it's all going to be worked out. But in the meantime, God has to deal with this spiritual being, Satan, 
No matter how much trouble Satan may cause, God cannot punish him or cut him off. He must establish the condition of having loved Satan regardless of where he found Satan. God can only have complete victory when Satan confesses to him, saying, Oh, God really is God. I surrender to you. This is the problem. Because of this, God is in the position of being tied up by Satan. Since the principal path of the providence of restoration is for God to bring about Satan's surrender by loving him, we who are his children must walk the same path. So, when you judge or look at Father's life without understanding this reality, you cannot understand who he was and what he went through. You cannot understand why he guided this movement that we became part of the way he did. He had to deal with a spiritual being that was in control, that no one else understood, no one else recognized. So we, we judge, we measure, we accuse, we, we, we look at father or the, the true parents from this limited perspective. But deep inside, father was waging a battle, a war, against a spiritual being in a way that we don't understand. How much pain, how much suffering was Father willing to go through to not curse, to not hate, to not be bitter, to not cut off evil and turn his back on it, but instead to patiently endure until Father could even help this archangel recognized his own mistakes and changed his nature and, and decided to come back. Here is Father in a public forum at the World Culture and Sports Festival teaching the most profound truth of God. But it just goes right over our heads. We have no idea, no understanding of what was going on. Everything Father was doing his whole life centered on this reality. It doesn't matter if a person is persecuted around the world and is considered a worldwide enemy. This person must establish the condition of having loved those who oppose him. From this aspect, there is amazing truth in God's words to love your enemies. In fact, this is one of God's battle strategies. These words sound simple. No one realized, though, that they have marked the boundary line between victory and defeat in the battle between God and Satan. If God were to adopt the philosophy of looking on Satan as his enemy and seek revenge against him, then God would never be able to stand on the pinnacle of victory. Thus God has said, love your enemy and has carried out a strategy of love. The words, love your enemy, also represent the culmination of Jesus' teaching. It is remarkable that Jesus, the only begotten Son of God, stood before Satan and prayed for him, despite the fact that Satan was trying to kill him. If Jesus, as he hung dying on the cross, had held any feeling of malice toward his enemy, God's providence would have been turned completely around. It is because Jesus overcame death with a heart of praying that his enemies might be blessed and of loving his enemies that Satan surrendered in that instance. This is true Christianity. If you really look at the history of the world, the reason why nations that are predominantly Christian are prosperous and blessed is because deep inside people, even against their own doctrines, they understand this fundamental principle of loving the enemy, being willing to sacrifice your life for the sake of another person. That's the fundamental core of the love that comes from God. 
So for all her faults, America's faults, the reason why God was able to bless this nation continually was because there were always some people here that were trying to, to, to manifest that ideal. And America is the place where all races, all cultures, all religions, atheists, Buddhists, it doesn't matter. Everyone came together here. And then we struggled and, and suffered and went through this process of trying to create an environment that would allow us to be here and to forgive, love, and unite with each other. This is where the qualifications to be God's eternal child comes about. Even Satan recognizes this qualification and gives his signature. You too will be able to stand before God and say, hey, Satan, am I not unmistakably the son of God? And Satan will reply, yes, that is correct. We must conduct ourselves in such a way that if we say to Satan, you have no problem then if people who live like me expand God's reciprocal realm, starting from the individual and moving to the family, clan, people, nation, and world. Satan's answer will be, that is the principle, so I can't do anything about it. So Father is saying, true parents are t telling us that we need to be able to know this truth and practice this love, this standard of love the standard of true love. If we practice the standard of true love, then even the archangel cannot prevent us from entering heaven, from, from, from connecting back to God. Even the archangel wants this. Even the archangel wants this now. But that standard of true love. If we don't know the truth, if we don't know the truth, then it's not true love. There's many levels of love, we know. But true love is deepest love. It is under these conditions that God has pursued the providence with the Christian cultural sphere at the center. Whether we find ourselves on the path of sacrifice, in the position of martyrdom, or in the midst of bloody battle, we must carry out a movement of loving God and loving even our enemies. We must carry out this movement in our families, in our societies, and in our nations. This is what it means to be connected to true parents. It's not how much money you give, it's not which particular son or daughter you happen to be connected to because of their personality or character. It's not anything external. It's much more profound. It's much deeper than that. Are we becoming people of true love? And the answer is yes, absolutely. You know, true parents came to accomplish two fundamental objectives. One, is to teach the truth of God, to teach the truth to mankind. The role of the parents is to educate and teach their children the reality of life. The second thing that true parents did is they cut the lineage. They severed our relationship with Satan. Through the blessing, we are not connected to that lineage anymore. We are not, and our children are not. So through the divine principle, through Father's teaching, through Father's words, if you join this movement and listen to Father and learn his words and try to practice it, then through the truth, your conscience can be elevated. But only through the blessing that true parents gave can the original mind finally, once and for all, be liberated. So our original mind and our conscience together now, we are free. Free at last. Free at last. Thank God Almighty, we're free at last. Now, 
Does that mean I don't make mistakes anymore? Does that mean I've, I always love people with a true heart and I'm like Father walking around unconditionally loving? No, not at all. I might still screw up. I might, I might make mistakes. I might let myself fall back into, you know, reacting to a situation, behaving unprincipally. But I am eternally connected to God through true parents. You are eternally connected to God through true parents. We cannot use Satan as an excuse anymore. You can't be like Richard Pryor and say, the devil made me do it. <laughs> it's the devil. He made me do it. <laughs> well, yeah, the devil did make us do it. But the time has come when we can stand up and not act that way. And we might not get it right every time. Because the reality is we don't have all the information. We have to be careful. Because there are many things we still do based on our conscience, based on what we think is the truth. So we have to be very careful. That's why we have to be very prayerful. Why do true parents teach us we should do hundake all the time? Hundake is teaching ourselves the word of God, the truth, so that our conscience can be fed, so that when we have to make a decision, we'll make a decision based on, you know, reality, the truth. But the original mind, we have a strong, original mind. <coughs> Our children are born with it because of the blessing. Their original mind is stronger. So in the world, what we see now happening is the world, the, 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 a lot of terrible things are coming to the surface. But <coughs> everything has to be dealt with one to one. Person to person, individual to individual. And we see that happening more and more. The Roman Empire severely persecuted Christianity, but it was forced to surrender in the face of the love by which Christianity loved even the country that was its enemy. This is how Christianity came to be a worldwide religion. The starting point for the path to heaven was within the country that was Christianity's enemy. Until now, Christians have only thought about loving their own personal enemies. But this is not correct. We must love the country that is our enemy, and even the world that is our enemy. But the bottom line, the reason why true parents are necessary is because Jesus was not able to teach clearly the principle, the divine principle. And he wasn't able to become the true parents. This is a reality that eventually Christian people are going to have to accept if they want to move to the next level. Connecting to true love. That's what it means. You know, it's very difficult. You know, put yourself in the in the, the position of a, of a Christian. I know because I was a born again fundamental Christian before I joined this movement. I went to the Pentecostal church. I was part of the University Christian Fellowship. I know what it's like, you know, to look at that Islam or look at Buddhists or look at people from foreign religions. It's very difficult to, you know, we, we have the word tolerance, right? I've, I've, to, I've explained this before. We're taught to tolerate. That's about the extent that Christians can reach. They can tolerate people of other faiths. But because they have this idea that soon, at some point, Jesus is going to come and he's going to send some of those people to hell, well, he's not going to send them to hell. God is. Jesus is going to protect people from God. If you accept Jesus, then you're protected. Who are you protected from? Protected from God. Because God is the one who's going to make the final judgment. Think about that. What kind of conscious idea is that? Jesus is protecting you from God. That's not what the divine principle teaches. God is unconditional love. You know, Satan is the one. The doctrine of the, some of these strange teachings, ultimately they were distor they're distortions of the truth. 
starting point on the path to heaven is within the country that is our enemy. Unless we create the foundation of the tradition of true love and set out on the basis of this foundation, we cannot bring about the kingdom of heaven on earth. When the tradition is established in this way, there can never be a philosophy or ideology greater than this. There's no new Messiah coming. Jesus is not going to come out of the clouds and none of Father's children are going to rise up and become, uh, you know, the, the, the new one to, for us to follow. It's already been taught very clearly. Very clearly. Our responsibility is very simple. We have to wrestle with whatever's inside of ourselves that is preventing us from connecting to the living God. We have to manifest a life of true love. How many of you know this person? His name is Ray Rice. Okay, does anybody know the story connected to this guy, Ray Rice? He's a great football player for the, for the Baltimore, Baltimore Ravens. So this is Ray Rice, and this is his wife. And there was an incident sometime in February. He was in an elevator with her. And she, they weren't married at the time. And the elevator door opened. I get, was this in Vegas? It was somewhere in Vegas. The elevator door opened, and he came out of the elevator with her, and she was unconscious. And he was dragging her out of the <coughs> elevator. And everybody knew he had punched her. He, he, you know, something had happened and he punched her. So this became an incident. Of course, police came. He was, you know, went to whatever it is. You know, there's some kind. Went to the authorities, the lawyers, you know, doctors. The, the incident was dealt with. But because there was an image of him coming off this elevator and her unconscious, oh, it's very shocking. So, because he's a professional football player, then the president of the, the, the football league, his name is Roger Goodell, many people went to him and said, look, this guy is bad news. You've got to get rid of him. You can't let him play football. If he stays on, in the football league, then what is this saying about our standard here? So, he suspended him for two games. And, you know, the incident kind of went on. And there were a lot of people that thought, oh, you know, you, you don't suspend this guy for two games. You know, this is an, he, he must have hit his wife. Not his wife, she was his girlfriend at the time. Well, several months pass. A couple of weeks ago, TMZ gets hold of a, a fil the images. Now they have the movie the videotape inside the elevator so they can see exactly what happened. And sure enough, he's in the elevator with his soon-to-be wife and they get into this fight and you can see her. She's angry and she starts swinging at him like this and she's punching at him. She punches at him two times and he backs <coughs> off, <coughs> bam, hits her in the head. Her head bangs up, and you know how the elevators have these, boom, she's Rails. unconscious. Now, everybody is watching this videotape. Oh my God, oh, you know, and all of the talking heads on CNN and NBC and Fox News and everybody's talking about this incident. How terrible, how awful. Yes, absolutely, you know. Who, who even wants to look at such a thing? Watching this, this guy punch out a woman. That's, that's evil. You know, there's no way around it. It's, it's a terrible, evil thing. However, this event, remember, took place in February, almost six months ago. They went to the police. They went to the doctors, the lawyers, their family. Everyone was involved in this situation. The police saw this video. The doctors, the lawyers, they all saw that video. We didn't see the video. They all saw it. She went on. She married him. Now they're married. So she and he somehow, for 
better or for worse, <laughs> resolve this issue. Then the videotape comes out. Now, so many people oh, are attacking. I wa one time I was, I was sitting in the McDonald's and I was, you know, selling my wood roses and I was taking a break, whatever, and I look up and I'm watching CNN and all of CNN is talking about how terrible Roger Goodell is. Roger Goodell is the, the owner of the NFL. He's the president of the National Football League. How awful, how terrible. Every single person is talking about this guy because he only gave him a two-game suspension, but later he apologized. He said, you know, I'm really sorry. I think I should have done more. And then, when he saw this tape, Ray Rice was kicked off the Baltimore Ravens. Boom. Kicked off the team, and Roger Goodell kicked him out of the NFL. Gone. He can't work anymore. His livelihood's finished. He may never play football again. So, on and on and on, we're just all these different people talking. She wrote a text. And she wrote a text where she was livid against the media. How can you, you know, this is my husband. You know, you don't know anything about this situation. I forgave him. You know, you're ruining our lives. Now my husband can't even work. Our livelihood is destroyed. You know, why? This, she wrote this. But in some of the news, they didn't even talk about her point of view. And I'm sitting there thinking, my God, did this guy, Roger Goodell, who's the president, did he, was he in the elevator too? Did I miss something here? And he kicked him off the team. Well, we have a problem. Because guess what? Ray, Lou, Ray Rice is not the only person who has problems with spousal abuse. There are many, not many, there are, are several specific football players who have already been in front of judges, who have records. It's very, very clear they abuse their spouse. So let me ask you, doesn't Roger Goodell have the responsibility now to go through all the records and kick out every single football player that has abused his spouse? I mean, that's the only reason Ray Rice was kicked off is exactly because they saw the videotape. So can we say, well, because there isn't a videotape of him doing it, then it's not, you know, if, if, if the tree falls in the woods and there's no one there to hear it, does it really make a sound? You know, if a husband hits his wife, but there's no other person there to see it, it didn't really happen, did it? The point I'm making is this. There are so many issues. But in the end, everything falls back to personal relationships. I wondered, you know, when I first read her text, I was concerned. Because we know that when women are in a situation where they're abused by a spouse, especially you know, a guy who's strong like that, we're concerned. Is she really, you know, is she really making a right decision or is she, is she doing this out of fear? Is she doing it out of guilt? Is, you know, you know, but based on her words, it would seem that this incident was a one-time incident. They, they're going to counseling, you know, they're, they're doing everything they can do. What more can you ask for? Can we forgive this person? If his wife is willing to forgive him and tr wants to try to make the relationship work, and they're going to counseling and they, you know, they paid the fine, they, you know, they did what they're supposed to do. Who are we? Who am I to judge them further? And also, how much do we want the owner of a company that we work for? to be involved in our personal life to the extent 